So I'd just first like to thank Eddie and the people at JGI for giving me this opportunity. This is really, really great. Um, I've been here since Tuesday, and I have learned just a bucket, and I've really enjoyed um, the opportunity to be here. So um, as you can see, um, I'm here in the field, and as Eddie said, the body surfing is better uh, on Point Panic than it is uh, in Lake Mendota. But uh, I had a great time in Wisconsin, but I'm, I'm glad to be back in Hawaii. And this is the field in which I work uh, over there in Hawaii in the shallow sand flats. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to talk to you today um, about a little bit about model systems in the beginning. And then I'm going to go into spending most of my time talking about the model system that I've been studying for most of my career. And this is a really important slide because it shows the um, biological complexities so, and the power of model systems. And so up at the top you see here um, on the left is um, what I consider a minor miracle. That is um, a single zygotic cell um, to George Clooney. And then, um, you know, the 10 to the 14th uh, cells uh, in, the, in the brain, nervous cells of a single genome, and then 10 to the 14th bacteria in the gut um, of many, many genomes. Very, very complex systems. And so what biologists do is they turn to simple systems, and I'm showing at the bottom here Nobel Prizes awarded in recent years in developmental biology. Um, and all six prizes in developmental biology were awarded to individuals working on models. So they're very powerful for giving us very basic ideas about how things work. So one should not rely on trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Like the existing model systems are not likely to give the answers that we need for symbiosis, in my opinion. So what we need to do is we need to go out and look at the experiments that nature has done. And so what I'm going to show you is, is some model systems that, that are being used uh, in, in exploiting nature's toolkit to give us some insight into how symbioses work. And so I'm showing a set here of really exciting model systems that are being developed here. The hydra, that's just epithelia. There's an endoderm and an ectoderm, and it's a really exciting system, uh, specifically being developed by Tom Bosch. And down here at the, at the base of the animals, uh, Nicole King is developing coanoflagellates. A bunch of people developing uh, model systems a little bit higher on the evolutionary scale here and some people developing vertebrates. What I'm going to focus on today, is I'm going to focus on, well, I wanted to say just one thing about these model systems that you see here. Just one thing. There is not one single animal in which you have genetics and all partners. Not a single animal system. So this is a huge challenge um, in, in uh, animal biology. There is one system in which well-developed genetics is in all partners, and that's in the rhizomium leguminous plant system. And so what I'm hoping is that eventually uh, this system that I've worked on in my life will be similar to the rhizomium leguminous plant system. But we do have some genomic challenges, as I'll mention in a minute. <clears throat> the reason why we like this system and the reason why rhizobium has been so powerful is um, I often show this slide. And what it is is that the squid vibrio system and the rhizobium legume system, their binary symbioses give you tremendous resolution. They allow you to drop in and listen to the precise dialogue. How many people in this room have seen this movie? It's a great movie. There's not a lot of action, but it's a great movie. Um, and it's the, about these two guys who get together for dinner and they spend time talking uh, over dinner. And you get to learn these people really, really well. And this is what you can do with a binary system. And I compare the gut to the Kumbh Mela celebration of the Hindus, where you've got 10 million Hindus. Try to figure out what's going on in the dialogue among those people at that celebration, I think is going to be a great, a huge challenge. <clears throat> so the challenges with the squid vibrio system and some of the problems we have, um, I've listed here. We ha only have genetics in the microbial partner, which I'm not belly aching. I mean, it's great because when we change Vibrio fisheri, the symbiont, and we put it in the host, we're changing, we're hoping to change something that, we, that will only change 
the light organ that will only change the tissues with which the symbiont interacts. Whereas when you do classical genetics, you change that gene everywhere in the body. And so there are advantages to only having, only changing the symbiont. Um, but we have no genetics in the host. And so I'm putting out a plea here for anybody who knows anybody who might be interested um, in trying to develop um, genetics uh, in the squid vibrio system. We'd love to have that person um, come and postdoc or whatever. The other thing about this system is RNA editing in cephalopods is thought to be thousands of times greater than it is in mammals and other systems. So this is also a challenge. And there's a very large genome, 107% the size of the human genome with lots and lots and lots of repeats. So lots of challenges there. Let me tell you some details for the, those of you in the audience who don't know about this symbiosis. So this casual guy here is a very small animal. It's only a couple of centimeters, two, three centimeters as an adult. Um, and if you were to do a ventral dissection, you would see that uh, there's this beautiful set of kidney-shaped structures in the center of the mantle cavity here, and that's the light organ that contains the symbiont. Um, the light organ is complex. The symbiont occurs in three separate independent crypts on each side of the light organ here. And it's surrounded by tissues that modify the light produced by the bacteria. So the light organ is like a backwards eye, except for instead of photoreceptive tissue, it has photogenic tissue. But all the analogs of the eye are present. And the tremendous evolutionary convergence from the morphological level all the way down to the developmental induction of these tissues um, to be eye-like. Vibrio fisheri, like all of the, the, or most of the symbiotic associations in your body, Vibrio fisheri occurs extracellularly along the apical surfaces of highly polarized epithelia, as shown in those EMs. Now, what happens is the symbiont um, associates over the, over the trajectory of the symbiosis with two different types of epithelia. And these types of epithelia are extremely highly conserved across evolutionary time. And I'm showing them here, mucociliary and microvillus. So here's a bronchial epithelium, and it doesn't look that much different from the epithelium on the surface of the light organ of a juvenile, where the bacteria will be um, harvested, and that's what I'm going to show you in a couple minutes. And then um, the microvillus, they, the cells eventually come to reside along microvilli of, of a deep crypts in the light organ, and um, here's the microvilli of the vertebrate gut. And so the, 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 there's tremendous... Um, conservation of the cells and the biochemistry associated with these cells. Now, studying this system since 1988, um, we have a lot of, lot of stories. But I've picked out a few things uh, that I hope you guys here will find interesting. But we've um, studied the whole trajectory of the development of the symbiosis establishment, establishment a new each generation, how the partners influence one another's development, and how in the world do you make a stable association such that the immune system doesn't get rid of the, the symbiont, nor do the, does the symbiont overgrow? Um, but today, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about establishment of the symbiosis. How do the partners get together in the first place each generation? <clears throat> well, the, to start off, I have to give you the landscape. The juvenile light organ is very different from the adult. And that is that the juvenile has two ciliated surfaces on each lateral face of the juvenile light organ. And these cili in the living animal, these, come, these two appendages come together to form a ring. And that ring has, uh, entrains water into the region of three pores at the base. And so what they do is they hatch out, they begin to ventilate seawater through their mantle cavity, mantle cavity of a baby, which is only a couple millimeters long. The mantle cavity is one microliter. So keep that number in mind, one microliter, as I go through the rest of what I'm going to be saying. OK, so um, this is where the symbiont will gather. What they do is once they've gathered, they go up. They have this trajectory up about 100 microns, up a duct, into an antechamber, through a bottleneck, into a crypt space where they eventually interact with two cell types, an epithelium and a set of hemocytes, which turn out to be really fascinating. Won't have time to talk about them. 
but they sample the crypt space and give the, give the animal information about what's going on in that crypt. But this is what it looks like when you finally get a colonization. So obviously, this guy didn't do a super good job. Um, only half of the light organ is colonized at this point. By tomorrow, the other half will be colonized. But what you can see here is you can see GFP labeled Vibrio fisheri, and they're actually deep within the tissue in this confocal. And so they've invaded host tissue here. And this is what a colonization looks like. So the symbiont, when it goes through this, imagine this. When you, when you get Helicobacter pylori, which is supposed to be a beneficial symbiont, according to Marty Blazer, when you get Helicobacter pylori, you ingest Helicobacter pylori at, you know, in, through, through the mouth, and it goes centimeters and centimeters and centimeters in a baby until it gets down to the place where it's going to reside. What is happening during that period? And so one of the, one of the things that we're asking is what happens as the microorganism, after it gathers on the surface, goes into the pores, down the ducts, into these antechambers, through a bottleneck, and then into the deep crypts where it resides and luminesces and serves the animal. I should say it serves the animal in anti-predation. So the animal events that ventral luminescence that matches downwelling moonlight and starlight so that it, it's a night active predator. When it comes out, it doesn't cast a shadow against the visual field of a predator looking up from below. So it's some kind of Klingon cloaking device or something. So, so that's, that's um, the trajectory that they have to go through. So, so you imagine that there are many, many, many different strains of Vibrio fisheri out in the surrounding seawater. What is the variation in the environment, in uh, environmental bee fisheri? And does this impact on their ability to colonize the host? So what I have down there at the bottom are, is, is some information about what this system faces when it's trying to get established. Remember I said there's, it's a one microliter, one microliter <laughs> volume in the mantle cavity. And at those Reynolds numbers, you know, there's not great exchange. So it's 0.1% of the bacterioplankton, and that is about 10 to the third Vibrio fisheri cells per mil with a background of about 10 to the sixth uh, mils uh, per mil of other species. So this is, this is really um, a huge feat that has to, that goes on. And that the bacteria make this habitat transition from being mixed members of the plankton to being the sole occupants of the light organ at about 10 to the 11th per mil, cheek by gel. So Ned Ruby's lab, with whom I collaborate, um, has uh, just recently done a study that, that went into press this week in ISME Journal. And so um, what, he, what we noticed early on, we did a study, my lab did a study, in which we showed that there were two different haplotypes of the host on either side of Oahu, one in Kaneohe Bay and one in Monolua Bay, uh, just on the other side of Diamond Head. And so, so what was interesting about that was that um, if they were Drosophila species, they would be completely different species. So the host is pretty different. So we thought, well, maybe the bacteria are different and there's habitat loyalty. Well, um, in Ned's, uh, Clotilde Bongrand in Ned's lab looked at this question and asked this question. And in fact, a bacterium that you isolate from Monolua Bay or a squid from Monolua Bay, th those bacteria are fully capable of colonizing any squid on Oahu. There's not a, any kind of difference. What about co-colonization? Are there any differences across strains in co-colonization? Well, it turns out that in co-colonization, some Vibrio fisheri strains are dominant. That is to say that some Vibrio fisheri strains, you'll look at the light organ, and every, almost every, every animal will be dominated 100% by Vibrio fisheri of, of a dominant strain. And then there are some um, that are shared. There are some strains that will share the light organ, that have a tendency to share the light organ. So there's turned out to be this really different strain behavior. 
And there's a bit of a, a hierarchy, and that hierarchy, you can see um, that Ned's lab established this hierarchy here. What this required is the fact that Clotilde could look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of animals. We, we generate you know, 60 to 100,000 juveniles a year, and so you can do huge experiments like this. And so you can see that they, she developed this dominance hierarchy. So there seems to be a dominant strain in and in a, in strains that share. And one of the things that was interesting was that they appear to have different strategies. So that in the laboratory, if you do the co-colonization, the social strains like culture better. And maybe they are in, in free living state, maybe they do better. You know, in other words, maybe there are different strategies for, for these, uh, for Vibrio fisheri. So, um, and the dominant strain, of course, uh, dominates in Squido. So, when they then did full genome sequences and, and, you know, a bunch of phylogenetic analysis, and they showed that indeed a whole genome, unrooted phylogenetic tree, shows that these guys. Um, all the dominant strains are related and all of the, the sharing strains are related. So that was very cool, that in, in Hawaii, they could, they could find these, these two very different um, strains. One of the things that's interesting is it's thought that the squid brought Vibrio fisheri to Hawaii um, uh, from Japan. And the only place that, that you don't find Vibrio fisheri is in the big island, the youngest island. And so you don't, and you don't find the squid there. And in places where they're squid or not, you don't see Vibrio fisheri. So a comparison of the genomes of, you know, Ned, Ned and, and Martin Poltz did a comparison of the genomes. And what they showed was that the dominant strain has 250 kilobases more than, than the shared strain. And so something has gone on there. And um, this would be something I'd really be interested um, to hear, to get input from, I'm sure they'd be interested to get input from JGI and other people about what's happening here, but it looks like all these genes are scattered. They're not, it's not like there's a pathogenicity island or something like that that went into the dominant strain. So we don't know exactly uh, what's going on there. What's more, we don't know exactly how they exert dominance, and so they're looking at the differences in those two, the, they're looking at those 250 genes to see what's in there. But one of the really fascinating things is that once you get into the light organ, remember uh, there are three independent crypts on either side. And so a dominant strain seems to be able to colonize all three crypts because the ones that are shared could share in this way, They could share by being in different crypts. So there's GFP and RFP labeled bacteria, two RFP labeled crypts and one GFP labeled crypt. And they could share that way or they could share this way. And so they could all of one, uh, one crypt could be dominated or one crypt could contain both strains. And so there's a lot of work to do, and I think imaging is going to really help us understand what's going on here. The idea must be, in my opinion, that the dominant strain is faster. And so um, um, that remains to be determined, um, but I think the, the, <clears throat> the answer will be in harvesting. So the issue is, how do they harvest? How do they get there each generation? And how is specificity of a thousand Vibrio fisheri against a million other bacterial cells, how is specificity determined? And how do these early events influence the eventual outcome? Of course, the idea is to engage Vibrio fisheri and only Vibrio fisheri. So, um, okay, in specificity and recognition, they're undergoing this habitat transition. And as I mentioned earlier, you're going from a very mixed, mixed culture to a pure culture of Vibrio fisheri at 10 to the 11 cells per mil. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so what happens? Well, the first thing that happens is mucus shedding happens. And so the animal sheds 
uh, mucus from the surface. Lots and lots and lots of mucus in response to environmental peptidoglycan. So the animal hatches into seawater. It is exposed to any old peptidoglycan from any old bacterial cell. What a great way to tell you can now, um, you're now in bacteria-rich water and can harvest your symbiont than to detect something common. So it sheds a, a bucket of mucus. So we begin to study what, what's going on there biophysically. So there's a biophysical component to this. And to understand the biophysical component to this, we're doing a collaboration with uh, <coughs> a bunch of people. We, um, uh, Jana Nauroth is sort of at the center of this. Very talented graduate student of John DeBerry's at Caltech, who's now moved on to the Wies. She's the Wies Fellow at the Wies Center for Bio-Inspired Design. Uh, mathematician. Ava Conso, uh, we have uh, Scott Fraser, and Ned and me provide the platform. We don't do much else. So what has Yana found? How does ciliary behavior affect capture of microbes at low Reynolds numbers? So she started to look at this ciliated field, these arms out there, and see what's going on. And she's able to characterize the trajectory of particles across this field. And it's just, it's really, really fun. The thing that was kind of disturbing, though, was to find that about only one in 50, my, uh, if, you, if you only use particles, only about one in 50 will be captured. All the rest are invected. Okay. So you're increasing the challenge here. How does Vibrio Fisheri do this? Well, the first, the, the next thing she asked was, does, is there a size selection for particles of a particular size, bacterial size specifically? So Vibrio Fisher is about two microns. She put in two and four micron particles. And this is what she saw. So if you look at this over time and you put the whole thing together, yes, indeed, there did seem to be um, size selection of two micron particles. So you ask yourself, is this like, so ciliated mucus currents are big in the ocean. Lots and lots and lots of things have ciliated surfaces, ciliated mucus surfaces. So is this, a, is this unusual? Is this a, a dedicated type system? Well, it turns out that all the systems that have been studied so far, they're not efficient at two microns. They gain efficiency at larger sizes. So this system that Vibrio Fisheri has, it has excuse me, that Euprimnoscolopes has, the host, would seem to be selecting very specifically for particles the size of the host. So what we're doing with these guys um, is we are we're trying to, to understand what the far field flow and near field flow does to encourage Vibrio fisheri. <clears throat> what we do know is that Vibrio fisheri comes in and it attaches to the cilia and it aggregates and I'm going to show you that in a minute. But these are important steps. It has the ability to attach and, and, then, um, and then it begins to talk to the animal. So we want to understand near field and, and far field flow and the impact on the whole system. So we have bio, so two micron particles are favored by the ciliated, ciliary flow. Well, there has to be something else because there are so many bacteria out there that are two microns. And so um, there are also biochemical determinants and that's what my lab has been working on. So the biochemistry of the system does three really, really, really important things. They, they encode specificity, they prime, the, the bacteria, and they produce a, uh, a chemotactic gradient. So what you're doing is you're winnowing for Vibrio fisheri against the background of everything else. You're preparing for the next steps. And so you, the bacteria are primed there, and for heaven's sakes, they're just out there, and there are these pores. They've got to know where to go. So what did we do? So what we did 
um, was we asked the question of when bacteria are beginning to associate with the animal in the first couple of hours of after hatching, what in the world are they saying to the animal? And you know what? I, I didn't think. So when you, when you give the animal the, the numbers of bacteria that they typically see, what you get is you get about five Vibrio fisheri cells aggregating on the surface. I didn't think that five Vibrio fisheri cells against the background of thousands of others would have any impact on gene expression of the host, but I thought we should try. <clears throat> well, in fact, it did in very exciting ways. So what happens is the, what, this, this great postdoc of mine, Natasha Kramer, working with Phil Rosenstiel, what we showed was that the bacteria attach to the cilia and they talk to the animal. And that changes the whole game. Talking to the animal changes the whole biochemical environment. So what was it that happened? In specificity, so what she found upregulated were a set of antimicrobials. And these antimicrobials are poured into the mucus. And it would appear that this, this cocktail um, seems to favor Vibrio fisheri. So there's just a bunch of antimicrobials. One really important one is hemocyanin, which is actually the blood, blood pigment. The carboxy terminal end has a peptide on it that has prophenyloxidase antimicrobial activity. And BPIs, for those of you who knew what BPIs are, and low pH. pH of seawater is somewhere around 8. By the time they get to the pore, the pH is about 5.5. And, and so you're, you're really getting a change in pH. They are primed in this mucus by some of the chemicals that are the host chemicals that are shed. One is hemocyanin. We believe that the prophenyloxidase primes them for going into the duct because the duct is on fire with hemocyanin and it primes them for being exposed to nitric oxide synthase. So there's a little bit of NOS that's put out into the mucus, low levels of NOS, and we know by, from um, uh, mutagenesis of Vibrio fisheri in the nitric oxide um, uh, resistance genes, they must have those in order to colonize normally. So out here in the priming, they get primed because the ducts are on fire with nitric oxide. And then the other thing um, that they get primed for is chitinase. They chemotacks to a gradient that's created of chitobios. They, the bacteria attach, they, they send out, uh, they cause the animal to export a chitinase that chitinase breaks down chitin that's in the mucus into chitobios, and that chitobios is, is to what Vibrio fisheri chemotaxes, but they won't chemotax unless they're primed. And so they, have, they get primed, and then they chemotax. So the chemotaxis looks like this. You can see them streaming into the pores of the light organ as groups, so they chemotax into the tissues. What do they look like when they're in the pores? Well, this is a really interesting picture that, um, that, that uh, I'm doing a collaboration with Anders Maibom um, at the EPFL of his very talented graduate student, Stephanie Cohen. And what she did was she labeled Vibrio fisheri, and there's a whole different, whole other story on what, when we label Vibrio fisheri, what molecules um, what he heavy isotope molecules are being transported to the host, which is a really interesting story. But here, for this right now, you can see the, the Vibrio fisheri um, as the labeled cells. These are a bunch of bacterial cells that are unlabeled. And I showed these to Ned, and he said, those guys are dead. He said, those bacteria really look stressed. If you look at a TEM of this, you can see that um, the, that the cells, the Vibrio fisheri cells here, do not have a black surface on them. This, these guys, all these bacterial cells here look like they have um, uh, prophenyloxidase activity or melanization happening to them, which is, is, is lethal. So this may be very, very important. There's something about Vibrio fisheri, that priming to low levels of hemocyanin and phenyloxidase activity out in the aggregate might be important um, for them when they go into the ducts. 
yeah, this is, <coughs> this is um, a really amazing thing. Vibrio fisheri has perhaps the strangest O antigen ever, and so that may be important as well. But I showed you this picture early on, and you see this, this pattern? They're very restricted. Once they get, um, the Vibrio fisheri cells seem to be restricted to the deep crypts once they go in. Uh, so if you look at this cartoon again, you'll see that this whole area is devoid of Vibrio fisheri. And so the only time, each day at dawn, 95% of the bacteria get vented out into the environment. Uh, the animal buries in the sand and vents 95% of its bacteria into the surrounding seawater. That's the only time they go back out, but the rest of the day they're restricted to this region. So what creates this pattern? Why doesn't Vibrio fisheri colonize that whole area? Well, one of the ways we're beginning to look at this is with a technique called hybridization chain reaction. It came out a few years ago, but it was really inefficient. And so now in 2014, we've gotten it to be very efficient uh, through the work of Niles Pierce at Caltech and uh, Scott Fraser uh, at USC. What this allows us to do, the hybridization chain reaction, is it's in situ hybridization method. And it allows us to study individual genes that are in very low copy. Um, in other words, the transcripts of these are, are not you know, huge. Like when you do fish, usually you want a really high, highly expressed transcript. For, for this, you don't need such highly expressed transcripts. And so what we're doing is you can watch bacteria deep within tissues. So this is going to be great for, for looking at where bacteria are in mice. And then we can localize the expression um, of multiple transcripts simultaneously um, in, in the organism. This is, uh, just to give you an idea, you can look up those papers if you're interested, but it's basically like, sort of like PCR within the cell. You know, you're, you're actually amplifying those transcripts so that you can detect them with fluorescence. So here are some individual Vibrio fisheri cells deep, deep, deep within the light organ. Actually, these are in the ducts, and this is way down deep in the crypts. I mean, that's amazing to be able to see that cell. Now, this, this is, it appears this way. This could be 16S, which this one happens to be. But we also did this with, Delta, uh, uh, with the Lux A gene, uh, which is not, that, um, not as highly expressed as this. So you can really get some great uh, images. Um, the really cool thing is that we see tremendous geography about the transcripts of the host. And so what I'm showing here, I call them the gatekeepers. These genes that I'm showing, this particular one here in pink, this Vibrio fisheri here, but in pink, the, the pores, the ducts, and the antechambers are full of lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which is something that, that your gut responds to when you have a lot of um, LPS around. But this seem, may very well be a gatekeeper um, to, to, um, uh, in the system. So another one that we found that has the same, we, we, we're beginning to expect that we're going to see this geography writ large, but there was another one, it was a protocadherin like transcript that localizes to the ducts and the antechambers after 24 hours of colonization. So this is a non-symbiotic animal, 24. But this is a symbiotic animal, and these, that's Vibrio fisheri. <clears throat> now, for those of you who don't know what protocadherins are, they mediate cell adhesion uh, in epithelia and in the nervous system. So they're, cell, they're, they're uh, homophilic binding calcium-dependent um, proteins. It's really big. And when you look at this up close, I mean, it's right here at that, at that bottleneck. That bottleneck is just, there's just a huge change at that point. And so it's restricted to that area. So, I mean, who cares about protocadherins? Well, we're really interested in them because um, bacterial interactions um, seem to upregulate the, the um, protocadherins of the gut brush border. So one example I've given here is that EPEC stimulates long-range microvillar dynamics, pulling protrusions toward the sites of bacterial attachment in a process mediated by the adhesion molecule protocadherin 24. Now, 
I told you we had this huge genome, right? Well, we did an RNA-seq of the 24-hour aposymbiotic and symbiotic transcriptomes. And we did three groups. We did wild type, a delta lux mutant that doesn't make light, which is defective in colonization, and then, um, and then the non-symbiotic animal. With data mining, we find 230 genes <laughs> in, this, in this, and this is with a lot of filtering. Um, and the, we have 230, the octopus seems to have 138. Um, we have 129 of these regulated in symbiosis greater than twofold. And this is in that light organ. This is not the whole animal, that's just the light organ. And so what is the pattern? We may be able to figure out what the pattern is of what this bacterium sees over time with regard to these genes. It's, there's a patterning and shaping of the environment by the host. So what we've done is we've selected eight transcripts for candidates, um, two constitutively expressed, um, four very highly expressed in wild type, one in the delta lux, and um, one in the non-symbiotic animal. And we're going to be doing this multiplexing, HCR. And it turns out that we'll be able to do, you know, 32 or something like that. And so we'll have this kaleidoscope of colors uh, across a confocal micrograph, uh, we hope. So, so this imaging has been a really powerful thing to tell us what goes on um, during the early events of symbiosis in the squid vibrio system. And we're really excited to continue that. Um, and once the bacteria get in, I wanted to mention that they then trip a clock. And the bacteria are absolutely essential for a dial rhythm that we think is a circadian rhythm on the symbiosis. And so what happens is there's a clock, one cry gene, which is a clock gene in the head that cycles with environmental light. The luminescence of Vibrio fisheri is 12 hours off that. And the cry gene in the light organ cycles with the luminescence. And Vibrio fisheri is essential for the cycling of that, and luminous Vibrio fisheri are essential. So if you, if you take that, if you, it, with a delta lux mutant, they don't cycle. What's really cool is you would think, well, maybe you can just shine light underneath. And Elizabeth Heath Heckman, my graduate student, tried to do that. And it turns out that it's MAMPS that prepares the animal, MAMPS of Vibrio fisheri, that prepares the animal to respond to light because bacteria are required. So if you take light and you take MAMPS, it all works. So it's <clears throat> um, the clock gene. It turns out now that, that the mammalian people have been finding that your gut bacteria drive your circadian rhythm which is very cool. So then in conclusion, I just want to say that it's my opinion, as I would have such an opinion, um, that model systems provide insight into mechanisms underlying symbiosis. Specificity of symbioses is most likely to involve, I would guess, almost in every circumstances, bio, biomechanical and biochemical factors. And imaging is a very powerful teacher. Somebody was talking about the, the, um, the soil and in the soil and in, in, with a goal to image what they're doing right there. And we've learned so much from imaging. It informs us about the location and the remote control of the association. So I just wanted to say thanks to all my students and postdocs and people who've worked with me, particularly Ned Ruby. He and I have been working on this together now since 1988 with great funding from various sources. And this was the 25th anniversary a couple of years ago at Madison in front of the Microbial Sciences Building. In addition, I've had um, great collaborators um, on this project. Every once in a while, um, somebody will come up to me and say, wow, I'm really fascinated by what you're doing and, and I want to take my thing and apply it to what you're doing or my um, I want to find out if my gene is regulated there or whatever. And so um, Ned has a similar set, which is different from mine, but these are people with whom I've collaborated heavily, particularly Ned. And Pete Greenberg has been a great supporter of our system over time. Mike Apchell and Bill Goldman um, have worked with me almost from the very beginning. And all these people 
um, 33 different labs from 23 institutions in four countries, and it's, it's been a great adventure. So with that, um, I will bury myself. <laughs> I will say goodbye. So this is what they do during the day. That the greatest animal ever. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Yeah. Have you gotten rid of all your Vibrio fisheye at this point? Have what? You gotten rid of your bacteria at this point? <laughs> yes, about 95% of them at okay. that point. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I very recently read a paper where people were actually looking at uh, gut, uh, uh, the gut microbiome of mosquito and actually trying to control mosquito using these microbes to actually produce RNAi and then deliver it in the insect. Mm -hmm. Is that a possibility you could consider for your system? That is a great question. We have tried that a little bit. Um, we, some, some people have given that a go. Maybe, you know, we should try it again. We haven't been, we haven't succeeded. In other words, those who have tried it have not succeeded. Yeah. Other questions? You mentioned how the, the luciferase production by the bacteria can can control the clock of the animal. Right. Is the colonization gated by the clock um, the so, other way around? <clears throat> so that's a great question. I can tell you that they are light inhibited from hatching. So the juveniles hatch when at dusk, beginning at dusk. So they're light inhibited from hatching and they are more difficult to colonize in the morning than they are at night. So what you're saying might be true, but nobody's ever looked at that very carefully. <laughs>